I want to welcome everyone to our Humanitini uh, here at the Tacoma branch of Bus Boys and Poets. My name is Jay Stewart. I am the program director for Humanities DC, also known as the Humanities Council of DC. And I want to thank you all for coming, despite the weather, which I understand is going to turn to snow soon. Um, I would also like to thank our host, Bus Boys and Poets. Specifically, I'd like to thank Alicia Bird, Denisha Bullock, and Patrick Bonasteel for their patience and help in putting this together. I'd also like to thank Chase, our on-site manager. I also want to point out Chris Galloway, a member of our board of directors in the back. And I'd like to recognize our staff. Um, from the right, Stephanie Scott, our office administrator. Jasper Collier, the director of our digital museum. Diane Griffin, who is our communications and development director. And Danielle Booz, our, um, our intern and a student at American University. I would also like to thank our honorary committee, um, which as of today includes every member of the DC Council as well as our mayor, Muriel Bowser, and selected or a number of local DC government officials from the planning office and elsewhere. I'd like to recognize Patsy Fletcher, speaking of, from the Historic Preservation Office, who's here in the audience. Um, and also, finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, DC Brow, Busboys and Poets, and a Creative DC. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Humanities DC and about what a Humanitini is. Humanities DC is an independent nonprofit affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the federal agency in charge of supporting the humanities throughout the United States. Humanities DC is an essential part of the district's effort to provide quality humanities related programs that preserve Washington's cultural legacy and promote civic engagement in every neighborhood in DC. This year marks the 225th anniversary of the founding of the District of Columbia. As part of this event, starting in January and continuing monthly for the rest of the year, we are holding panel discussions of scholars and contemporary commentators to discuss the highlights of a series of 20-year periods in the history of this great city and to link the events of the past to present-day issues and concerns of district residents. Humanities DC hopes to illuminate the often overlooked local history of the nation's capital and to define aspects of a unique contemporary culture of the district. Given the cultural and economic changes taking place in this city, we believe that reflecting on what our history has to teach us about the present is both timely and important. Today we will discuss the topic of the District of Columbia in relation to its suburbs, Arlington, Alexandria, Montgomery County, and Prince George's County. The time period which forms the basis for our discussion is the, area, the era excuse me, between 1851 and 1831. This is a time when the Commonwealth of Virginia retroceded or took back the Virginia part of DC. When Andrew Ellicott and Benjamin Banneker initially set the boundary lines of DC in the 1790s, the jurisdiction included present-day Arlington and part of the city of Alexandria. Congress intended for the district to have a diamond shape, stretching 10 miles square. Virginia's decision, decision in 1846 to take back Alexandria County, as Arlington and Alexandria were then known, shattered the diamond. This decision also had the effect of creating the first suburb beyond the city limits. Today we will hear from a panel of experts drawn from all four of the suburbs immediately adjacent to DC. They will tell you about the experiences today of people living and working in the suburbs, or more often living in the suburbs while working in DC. These suburbs have their own unique character, but they also contribute to the history and culture of the area known colloquially as the DMV, meaning the greater DC area. So I'd like to take a minute to recognize one of our board members who just walked in, Marjan Shalal. I guess she may have stepped out briefly. Um, but I'd also like to identify our panelists. So starting on the farthest from me, I'd like to recognize Adrian Terrell Washington, an adjunct professor, professor of English at Northern Virginia Community College, Alexandria campus. Adrian will be our moderator for the evening. I'm clap at the end. John West Bay is the curator and chief operating officer of the Prince George's County African American Museum. Um, he will soon be on his way to the University of Maryland University um, College um, as a curator, I believe, of their collections. Is that right? So congratulations to you for that. Seated to his left is Mayor Kate Stewart. The Honorable Kate Stewart is the mayor of Tacoma Park, Maryland, which is right over there, um, for those who don't know. And finally, Craig Syfax is the president of the Black Heritage Museum of Arlington, Virginia. 
So with no further ado, I'll hand things over to Adrian, our moderator. Um, what we're going to do uh, to begin with is each one of us will uh, speak about the period and about the work that we're doing in the various suburbs, uh, the area we all call the young people rather, started calling the DMV, which is District Maryland in Virginia. And uh, you know, when you go out of town or you go ac uh, uh, across the big water, somebody asks you where you're from, you never say you're from Virginia or Maryland. You say you're from Washington, D.C. <laughs> right? <laughs> Even if you live in uh, Prince George's County or you live in Montgomery County, a lot of people will say they live in Washington, D.C. And the younger people have more connection because I believe of the transportation access that they have through Metro and through Uber and uh, uh, ride share. They get around a lot better than uh, people in our uh, generation who, who stuck to whatever jurisdiction we were born in and lived in. It's, it's amazing how they are able to go to all sorts of uh, events and meet each other uh, through social media, what they call meetups. <laughs> And, and that kind of thing, uh, and which I think is a really good thing because it does bring in people that don't normally come into DC and it also takes people from DC out to the suburbs where they may never have uh, traveled before and that's why I'm glad that we're having this program today because you get to see uh, how those of us across one bridge or another live. <laughs> um, People might not be aware, but the uh, 14th Street Bridge used to be called the Long Bridge. Uh, free African Americans went back and forth uh, uh, walking across the Long Bridge until the Civil War when they pulled up the planks so that the Southerners, the Confederates, couldn't come across the, the Long Bridge. But uh, one of the things that happens in the time period that we're discussing, uh, the period between 1831 and 1851, was the Pearl Affair, which is when a group of slaves were able to escape on a schooner. Uh, and then, unfortunately, one of us gave the rest of them up to the master and said, you know that they got away. And the schooner, it was uh, uh, wind powered. And uh, it got all the way down to like Mount Vernon and the wind died. And that gave the white uh, uh, posse a chance to gather and go for them. And they c captured them and sent most of those slaves to Louisiana. But what you might not be aware, there's a group of women, there were two women, they were called the Edmondson sisters. The Edmondson sisters, there is a statue even today in Alexandria toward, for remembering the Edmondson sisters. It's on Duke Street. If you get a chance, Duke Street in Alexandria not only has, it's the Edmondson sisters statue is located right where the Bruin slave pen was. That was part of the uh, redevelopment of that area. And if you go down three blocks, you will be at the Urban League's office where there, if you go in the basement, there is still the slave pen with the shackles and everything else on the wall. So you may not know, but Alexandria has a lot of history uh, with regard to African Americans because a lot of contraband went there. And I am involved in a project called uh, the Fort Ward Project. And this has been circulating around the room. And we have put in uh, some signs at Fort Ward, one of the forts that many African Americans uh, developed communities around the forts, uh, the Civil War, like Fort DuPont, Fort Reno, things like that you're familiar with. So even though you don't think that the suburb still has a connection today to DC, there is and there are lots of historic uh, sites as these, uh, everybody will um, 
will let you know about that you can go on the web, at least in Alexandria, you can go on the web for the uh, Office of Historic Alexandria, and there is a listing of all the black, um, the African American sites that are still available, and if you want to ask questions about that later, we'll, we'll take that. I'm going to pass off now, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to Prince George's County, we'll go to, um, uh, Tacoma Park in Maryland, and then we'll come back to Virginia and Arlington. How's that? How's it going, everybody? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm John Westbay. I'm the uh, chief curator and acting executive director until tomorrow. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, if if you haven't been to the Prince George's African American Museum, uh, you can go until tomorrow for free uh, and tell them that I said it. Uh, <laughs> It's my last day, what can they do? So, um, but if you haven't been to the Prince George's African American Museum, you, you absolutely should. It's a great place and it's been open since uh, 2010. I've been there since 2010 and we've done, um, gosh, about 14 exhibits in those years. We've done exhibits uh, that specifically relate to African American life, arts, and culture in Prince George's County. And, um, and, and, and you know, if you haven't been to Prince George's County, there isn't one place that you can say is, is a Prince George's County place. Uh, there's some rural areas, there are very urban areas, there are, um, it's home to the uh, largest population of uh, highest educated and high income uh, African Americans in the country. And so, uh, and so there are suburbs, there, there are just so many places that make up Prince George's County. And uh, you'll see a lot of those exhibits if you go to the museum which you will for free tomorrow because, uh, because I said so. Now, after tomorrow, I can't promise anything. So, um, uh, you know, I can talk a little bit more about Prince George's County. I have to uh, confess that I don't live in Prince George's County. So I live in Southeast DC. Uh, and so uh, I, I talk about it as someone who, who, who works there and, and it does not live there. So. Um, I can just tell you from people that I've interacted with that are Prince Georgians, uh, they're very proud of, of, of Prince George's County and, uh, and, and all it's, it has accomplished in the last, um, you know, since its existence, but especially in the last 20 years. And so uh, I think that, that's all, I'm, I'm gonna stop there and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some other things that are related to Prince George's County. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Kate Stewart. I'm the mayor of Tacoma Park, Maryland. I'm glad to be here this evening. Um, I'd just like to recognize first Diana Cohen, who's the um, president of Historic Tacoma. So, in fact, if you actually have any questions about the history of Tacoma Park, Maryland, or Tacoma, D.C., she's your woman. Uh, so, but I'm very glad to be here uh, this evening. In uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, we like to say we live on the edge because we are right near Washington, D.C., Prince George's County, and we're in the southernmost part of Montgomery County. Um, we have a really interesting history in Tacoma Park, um, one that is very closely related with Tacoma, D.C. Um, in fact, our, our origin started back in the 1880s, um, when if you can imagine for a moment what it looked like here in the 1880s, um, it looked very different. It was actually a lot of thick forest, not many stores or shops, but we had a railroad. It was one of three railroad stations in the area where people could get out of downtown DC. And that was the attraction for a man named B.F. Gilbert, who was a wealthy New Yorker, and all roads lead back to New York. <laughs> Um, and he came down here and he purchased 100 acres. And the land was on both sides of the railroad track. So some of it was in Maryland and some of it was in DC. But that didn't bother B.F. Gilbert because the reason he was here was because it was a lot nicer to breathe the air here and it wasn't as crowded. So if you can imagine the late 1800s in DC, it was crowded and it was hot. And so if you had money, one of the things that happened is that people came and moved out here um, or they spent their summers here. So they'd come out and this would be their summer place. And <clears throat> by 1885, we had about 100 residents living in both Tacoma, D.C. and Tacoma, Maryland. And we, the community grew up together. 
basically. There was very little distinction between the Maryland side and the DC side. When um, Tacoma Park incorporated in the later 1880s, uh, it just took the Maryland side. It didn't take any of the uh, other part of DC. But still, the communities worked together. They lobbied together for the library, schools. Sometimes children in the Maryland side would go to the DC schools. Um, and they had this relationship. Now, like any long-term relationship, sometimes there's togetherness, and sometimes you go your own way. Uh, and that happened after World War II. Uh, Tacoma Park really started focusing on um, other things, and the DC side focused on really its own uh, close-in neighborhoods. But it wasn't long until the 1960s that the two communities came back together again to fight against what was going to be a 10-lane freeway from the Beltway all the way through here to the National Mall. So can you imagine that? We would not be sitting here today. <laughs> there would be a 10-lane freeway here. But thankfully, because of the long-standing relationships between residents in DC and on the Maryland side, they got together and they fought, and they fought hard. And what ended up happening is we didn't get a freeway, but we got a metro. And what we also got was historic distinction in both the DC side and the Maryland side, which has been integral to preserving our communities. Um, so like I said, any relationships, Sometimes there's togetherness, sometimes you go apart. I like to think, as the mayor of Tacoma Park now, that we're entering another time of great togetherness. Um, restaurants like Busboys and Poets here on the DC side. We have Republic and Kinda and Mark's Kitchen on the Maryland side. We have wonderful um, shops and other businesses that we work together. In fact, there's a local business here, Rhizome, uh, that received a grant from the Tacoma Park City Council, uh, even though it's on the DC side. Uh, so there's a lot of togetherness, and I'm hoping that we will continue that uh, in the near future. My name is Craig Syfax. I am president of the Black Heritage Museum of Arlington, Virginia. Arlington is known as the bedroom to the government because most of the people in the government live in Arlington and because it's an easy commute. Arlington began at Robert E. Lee's house. That is the name where Arlington's name came from. The George Washington Park Custis built the house that Robert E. Lee lived in and it was called Arlington. So that was where they chose the name at the time to call it Arlington. Arlington has three black neighborhoods that came out of the origin of Freedman's Village, which happened out of emancipation. And Arlington also has highly ranked schools in the nation, and we boast that we have the most college degrees in one area in this area. I don't want to talk much because I want to hear what you all have to say and what, to, what, what you want to ask and why you're here. So. With that, let's continue. Uh, just briefly, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention the historical events that happened in our time period that we are talking about historically, which is 1831 to 1851. And that included what you may not be familiar with, which was the Snow Riots. There was a riot on Pennsylvania Avenue, 1831, at a uh, Beverly Snow was a free black man who had a very posh restaurant. And because of some things that happened, a white mob started to, to tear that apart. And uh, that is, was one of the first riots in the race riots in the District of Columbia. We are all familiar with the story, 12 Years a, a Slave. Uh, Solomon Northrop in 1841 was captured in the District of Columbia in the Gatsby Hotel on the Hill. We also know that the reason why DC is only 69 miles now instead of 100 miles is because in 1846, that's when the uh, vote happened that Virginia got Alexandria and Arlington went back to Virginia and that is why the, the, we no longer have a diamond. Uh, it's, it's cut off at the bottom. <laughs> um, and uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, uh, 
published the first North Star in 1847. I mentioned to you the Pearl Affair in 1848. And I don't know if you all are familiar with Matilla Minor. Matilla Minor is a, is a woman from, a white woman from Massachusetts who came to D.C. and opened up a school for colored girls. And that school taught, taught girls how to be secretaries and teachers. And that school is the seed of UDC today. So uh, she uh, does not get the recognition. It used to be Minor's Teachers College is still on ha uh, Howard University's. Um, campus. So I just wanted you to know that during this period, there's a lot of abolitionist work. A lot of ab abolitionists came here, and this is part of the reason why Virginia went back to, Alexandria and Arlington went back to Virginia because the Virginians were afraid that Alexandria would become free and then that would set up um, uh, Virginia not to continue to be have the slave trade, and you know that was one of their biggest commerce at that at that time. So um, one of the questions we wanted to uh, one of the questions we wanted to uh, to ask of the panel is um, uh, I guess answered that question <laughs> <laughs> about retrosection. Um, I wanted to ask, let's see, what does Jay got here? Um, why is Prince George's County called Ward 9? <laughs> That's you. <laughs> why is Prince George's County called Ward 9? Um, and again, this is from somebody who is not from D.C. or Prince George's County, so I'm only repeating what I've heard. <laughs> So we'll take that I don't want anybody to follow me out into the parking lot, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, my understanding is that, you know, uh, there was a large African-American population, of course, always in the district and especially in Southeast D.C. And with uh, movement of people from, uh, for, for development, uh, with movement from people from certain areas of Washington, D.C., um, a lot of them ended up moving out into Prince George's County and having roots in D.C. And so even today, uh, even with a lot of work that we would do at the museum, uh, there are a lot of people who, who have relatives that, are, that still live specifically in Ward 8 and, uh, and, and kind of travel back and forth. So there's a, um, because so many people in Prince George's County have roots that, that go into D.C. specifically across that, that uh, southeast border, uh, it's considered Ward 9. From what I understand, it can also be offensive to some people. So that's why I say, don't follow me out into the parking lot. I, I'm just repeating what I've heard. Um, but uh, with that said, you know, th there's a lot of great things about uh, the, the culture, the kind of cross culture that you see with uh, DC and with Prince George's County. There are a lot of um, people who make very sharp distinctions, but there are a lot of similarities between people uh, across those borders. Right. Well, one of the reasons uh, it's called Ward 9 is because people historically uh, like to give credit to Marion Barry for the uh, workforce that he developed uh, during his tenure that created a black middle class that then could afford to go to uh, Prince George's County. But you're right, a lot of people bristle at the uh, notion that they're Ward 9. And what about when you say PG County? How do people feel about that? Yeah, again, so uh, <laughs> uh, there have been some people that are very offended by the term PG as opposed to saying Prince George's County. And matter of fact, when I first started working at Prince George's African American Museum, I made the mistake of saying PG. And, and I got a lecture about why we should say Prince George's African American Museum. So right now, that's why I, I, I don't even use PG in, 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 in any of my normal speech. Um, I, I think part of it is that um, yeah, calling it PG means that it's less than something. So mm -hmm. it's not a, you know, there's no other, or how it's been explained to me, is there, there aren't any other counties, like nobody, um, uh, abbreviates Arlington or, or, or Alexandria or even Montgomery, even though there are some abbreviations for it. And uh, so people will say all these other full names of the counties, but then refer to Prince George's as, as PG. 
And then uh, there's another piece of it that uh, that likens it to DC. So you say DC and PG uh, with these two very short abbreviations. And I think some Prince George's uh, look at it as as um, as wanting their own identity. So by saying Prince George's, you're uh, you're acknowledging that there's something very unique and different about it. But you know. Aside from being unique and different, there are lots of different areas of Prince George's County that have very different identities as well. So you have, you know, Capitol Heights, which feels very different than Upper Marlboro. That feels very different than Hyattsville. And um, I don't, you know, I don't think there's any one place that you can say is specifically Prince George's County because there are lots of different experiences there. Um, okay. So. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, Mayor. Got through that one. Yes. <laughs> you mentioned, Mayor, that um, there is some interaction between uh, Tacoma Park, D.C., and P Tacoma Park, Maryland. But do they share a common identity? And what attracts people to Tacoma Park in general? Well, as I mentioned before, back in the 1960s, there was uh, a national attention brought to this area because of the fight against the freeway. And it was at that time that um, Tacoma Park, especially on the Maryland side, became known as the Berkeley of the East or the Republic of Tacoma Park. Uh, and so it became known at, uh, for its uh, liberal views. Uh, we're also a nuclear free zone. Um, so uh, that image <laughs> um, really began during the 1960s. Today you would be progressives. I think today, yes, it would be progressives. Um, and our history with um, Tacoma, D.C., as I said before, there's um, a, a lot of great things in common. Um, the, unlike, I think, with Virginia, um, it's hard to know where the boundary is. Um, there is a, the, still the stone that you can see out here, but it's you know, very few people actually know here's where D.C. starts and here's where um, Maryland starts. Um, in fact, I've had many conversations with um, representatives on the D.C. side <laughs> about who owns certain streets oh, and sidewalks. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, and even sometimes our police departments get a little bit confused. Um, but that's why cooperation is very important. Um, but when people say Tacoma <laughs> Park, they do think of very liberal, mm -hmm. yes. Birkenstock, things yes. like that. Yes, tie dye. Yes, <laughs> tree huggers. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I, I was going to say there is a common identity yes. mm -hmm. with that. How much does the um, metro attract young people to? Uh, Tacoma Park because it's so centrally located. It is centrally located and um, in the last few years we've actually seen um, a, a great change in the area. Um, it's not only um, the metro has been here for a while uh, but also um, opening of restaurants like here, Busboys and Poets. This is just amazing to have in our community, not only because of the amazing food that you're all eating in front of me, and I have not eaten dinner yet, so I will forgive you for that, but, um, but also what Busboys and Poets does in terms of bringing together a community. Um, and we have a number, and that's one of the things that we have in common on the DC side and the Maryland side, is that our businesses and our restaurants, um, they do more for the community. Uh, their community gathers places for people to come together and that's what keeps us close. Yeah, I saw that line out there yeah. when we came in. Uh, Mr. Safax, I just want to let people know that the Safax name is very prominent in Arlington. He did not mention that. Uh, and in D.C. as well. Um, and uh, they owned a lot of land, right? Your family in D.C., which is now downtown D.C. at one point. And they, they have really kept up uh, the African-American heritage in Arlington. So I want to thank you, uh, for your family, for, for all the work that you all do in Arlington that people are not familiar with. Let me ask you this. Um, do you think that the uh, Potomac River creates a barrier between D.C. residents and Arlington, with the exception of maybe Georgetown and Roslyn? I mean, you see a, people going across the Key Bridge back and forth. But otherwise, you, you don't, you, I, I wonder how many people are making that trek across the river. In the beginning, if we go back to the retrocession itself, the reason Virginia 
Well, I would say the effects that it had on Virginia was George Washington owned the Mount Vernon Alexandria side and George Washington Park Custis owned from like the rest of uh, Alexandria to the Memorial Bridge. So those two had like the main they were had a monopoly on the charter on the on the shore there the, the commerce that came in that way so george washington with his mind he thought that he didn't want to have a monopoly he wanted to make it open for everyone and he thought that the reset re retrocession would cause that by bringing commerce to the area but uh, it only made him and uh, the other guy more wealthy than anyone else Back to your question, um, Arlington being the bedroom of the government, so everyone travels back and forth across that way. The water seems to be something that people enjoy on the Fourth of July. You know, for on both sides, they uh, stay in the middle and watch the fireworks from there. But uh, Arlington enjoys the skyline that we see, and I'm sure DC looks at our skyline and enjoys that. Am I but does close? it create a does it create <laughs> does the water itself create a natural barrier or a boundary that that uh, doesn't allow people to cross over as freely as Maryland and DC are are contiguous. So, you know, people just have to drive on the street. But when you say I'm going to Virginia, people are like, ah, oh, you gotta go over the Woodrow, you gotta go over the Key Bridge, you gotta go over one of those bridges. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't, you know, and we know that the Woodrow Wilson Bridge is owned by all three jurisdictions. Half of the bridge is Virginia, half the bridge is Maryland, and the water underneath is D.C. So there's the true DMV point. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but it seems that going over a bridge or going across the water uh, doesn't have the people from Virginia mingling as well with D.C. as the people from Maryland. Would you agree to that? I would agree to that now because Arlington is bustling. They have Clarendon, they have Roslyn, they have Sherlington, they have Westover. We have places that are self-contained now and people like to live where they work and socialize as well. But uh, D.C. is still a place that uh, people travel to, like to the Verizon Center to see the Wizards or the Caps or either sporting or uh, music event at the 930 Club. But I don't think uh, in the subway is a great uh, access you know, point for people to get to, to and fro. So do you think either of you that the suburbs have the same uh, taboo or the same distance uh, from the city uh, or disconnect from the city as it did maybe 10, 20 years ago when Arlington was a, you know, a bedroom, more of a bedroom community in terms of commuters and just people went home and they didn't come back into the city to, to, uh, to do cross events. There used to be talk of uh, taxing the Virginians for coming into D.C. Of course, I'm against that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, to even talk about that taxing, to coming back and forth like that, to put a toll on that, that would definitely cause some problems for Virginia to come into, into D.C. at that point. But other than that, I don't see any other problem. Uh, the, the big question is, you know, D.C. does not have voting rights. Uh, and uh, there have been a number of ideas thrown out, one being that uh, Maryland, uh, that D.C. is retroceded to Maryland so that they can have voting rights, or that uh, D.C. takes back the Virginia territory. What do either of you say about those ideas? Nobody wants, to nobody wants to touch that question. Well, I would, I'll just say, in Tacoma Park, Maryland, we feel very strongly about voting rights. In our local city elections, 16 to 17-year-olds can vote. Undocumented residents can vote in our local elections. And those um, who have committed a felony and are out on parole can also vote. So I think you would have strong support from residents of Tacoma Park uh, to work very hard on finding a solution to get voting rights in D.C. Okay. Arlington and Alexandria back to DC. 
I don't see that happening at all. <laughs> Arlington and uh, Alexandria are self-contained, and they have their own identity now. But I don't think they would want to be or collaborate as that again. Okay. My personal, my personal. Okay. Thank you all. We, I want to go ahead and ask questions of the audience now. Uh, if you have questions for our panelists regarding uh, the suburbs and uh, its interaction or not with uh, the Center City area. Uh, used to be, as we know, that D.C. was just a place you came to work and then you went home uh, if you were lived in the suburbs. But that, as I say, has uh, thankfully changed in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Yes, sir, the gentleman in the back. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, I just wanted to make a couple comments on the War Nine. Uh, no, 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 this is just um, in, uh, War Nine. Uh, often referred to uh, Prince George's County as being War Nine. Uh, many years ago, when I was studying this stuff, um, looking at the census data, and in 1980, for the 1980s, the absolute drop in population in terms of numbers match the abs absolute increase in the number of African Americans in Prince George's County. So the drop in the number of black people living in the district matched the number of black people who moved to Prince George's County. Now clearly black folks were moving to uh, Virginia and, and Montgomery County. And, but it, so part of, part of the designation as Ward 9 is really part of the black suburbanization movement. And while we focus a lot in D.C. on gentrification and displacement, there has not been as much attention given to the black suburbanization phenomena. And the, because Prince George's County is also known as the first predominantly black middle class suburb in terms of it, its, its income and wealth and so forth. So it carries both those designations. <clears throat> and regarding the, um, the high wave movement, uh, there there is a, was a book written many years ago called Highways to Nowhere, and it documented communities across the United States who stopped highways. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Barbara McCulsey got her start in Baltimore by stopping the highways coming through Baltimore City, uh, and, and story after story. So when I tell the story, I say, if you ever come into D.C. and you get around New York Avenue, you come under the tunnel and it just kind of gets confusing. Everybody had that experience? Well, that's where the highway was going to pick up. 95 was going to come through the district, as the mayor indicated, up through uh, this part of town. And at that time, according to the transportation plans, almost 70 to 80 percent of the District of Columbia would have been highways. Uh, and, and so it shows the significance. The other, the other story I tell is you're coming in from Northern Virginia and come up 66 and you get to New Georgetown and it all gets kind of confusing. Well, it was supposed to be something called the Three Sisters Bridge that was gonna come across the river and go into Georgetown, but there was another community that stopped that. So we get these strange highways to nowhere. You get these strong communities that have built themselves as a result of being able to uh, stop that movement. Uh, while he's going towards him. Yes, there is now a large African-American community in Prince William County in Virginia to the point that it's got uh, a designation as a minority majority district. And uh, there, was, uh, there had to be a uh, uh, federal judge who approved that because the Republicans in the Virginia legislature wanted to make a funny uh, district that went all the way from Norfolk to Richmond which is crazy, and then they wanted to do uh, a, um, a district below uh, Alexandria, below Fairfax County, where a number of those people are, are now living, as you, as you pointed out. Rich history about Blanche 
Bruce in Prince George's County, he owns a plantation and all of that there. Do you have any of that information in the museum, or have you done anything on that at all? Because I don't think there's a lot that people know about that history. Um, I'm just curious as to why, you know, I've never really heard anything about his. Yeah, the short answer is no. There, there isn't anything currently there about about uh, Blanche Bruce at all. However, there's a lot of great stuff there if you want to, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, let's take the first question uh, about the black middle class in Prince George's County and did it originate in Southwest? Yeah, so, you know, again, there are several places from D.C. that Prince George's County residents ended up coming from. There's a whole history of Southwest. There's a whole history of displacement from Southeast and other areas from the city. So I, I don't want to give the impression that there is that that 
the majority of Prince George's County people that people from DC that moved to Prince George's County came from a particular area. So there are multiple areas uh, and multiple stories. And I know that the, the Anacostia Museum uh, is doing a, a research project about um, displacement into Prince George's County from, uh, from Southeast and, and, and have some really interesting research about that. Um, I, I can only emphasize again that when you talk about the the wealth and the the high levels of education of African American populations in Prince George's County, that um, there there are just different populations all over the county, and and I, I wouldn't make a direct link between displaced populations from anywhere in D.C. and what uh, and 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 populations that that are that are that are wealthy and that there there's a history behind that too. And I would tie it in in, in the museum. We did a, a exhibition a few years ago about uh, African Americans that came home after World War II, and. Um, and I think the biggest link that you can find between African American wealth and education in Prince George's County is uh, the, the federal government and, and civil service jobs. And so you had your first wave of folks that, you know, would start out at a, at a very low level, work their way up, and then, you know, uh, their kids would start working for the government. They could afford enough money to be able to, to buy a big house and to send their kids to college. And so I think that's probably more of a link uh, jobs are probably more of a link, and specifically federal government jobs are probably more of a link to the high number of, uh, of African Americans who are highly educated and, uh, and, and, and have wealth uh, than, than displacement. So I hope I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if she was speaking of the displacement in the 60s or the displacement uh, more recent. No question is a stupid question. I would suggest to you there, there were two waves. Uh, I think you're talking about when uh, Southwest was uh, taken over by the federal government uh, in, the, in, in HUD during the, um, that was in the 60s when we had what was called urban renewal and we called it urban removal because I lived on Half Street uh, as a child. Then there's the second wave of displacement which occurs with the baseball stadium. That is, a, uh, that population was of uh, a lower income level, uh, but uh, they too were displaced when they got rid of a number of the public housing, uh, um, uh, what I want to say, apartments down there. And it, it began that wave of gentr gentrification. Uh, mainly, uh, uh, the impetus there was the uh, baseball stadium. And if you go down to the baseball stadium, and you all know now, it doesn't look anything like <laughs> what it used to. Now, the second question you had uh, will direct to the mayor uh, about uh, yeah. the Adventist mm -hmm. in Tacoma Park. So um, the Seventh-day Adventist um, came to Tacoma Park in the early 1900s, uh, and it was their world headquarters for a, for a number of years until, what is it, Diane, 1980s, uh, until the 1980s. And so even though Tacoma Park, Maryland, is relatively small, we're about 2.4 square miles, um, we actually have two rather large Adventist churches <laughs> um, in Tacoma Park. Uh, one is, uh, you can see, is kind of our entranceway uh, here in Tacoma Park. It's a beautiful church. Uh, and the other is on uh, Flower Avenue. Uh, we also have a number of Seventh-day Adventist schools in our community still. Uh, 
And I think it, the fact that the Seven Day Adventists had their world headquarters here, there was a number of things that um, occurred because of that. One of the interesting things is some of the uh, deeds to the houses actually used to say in them that you couldn't have alcohol in your home or serve alcohol because that's something the Seven Day Adventists do not believe in is um, drinking alcohol. Um, so actually people up until relative release recently still had that written into their deeds. I, well, um, <laughs> Uh, but I think the, the very unique thing about having, um, you know, as we were talking about before, about Tacoma Park being a progressive place, a place, you know, people talk about hippies and other things, um, but also being a place that's the world headquarters for religion, like the Seventh Day Adventists, uh, just shows the diversity of the community. Um, for being, you know, 17,000 people, 2.4 square miles, um, we have a, a lot of different people in, packed in there. More questions. More questions. Yes, this lady. Okay, um, so I guess my question is, and I'm, I'm not an original like DMV resident or anything, I'm coming, I guess I'm ready to come south here. And uh, as an educator and I guess as a community, my question is, in Kiki County, since you all have that rich history about, you know, uh, that, you know, African Americans that up and up with the Nobel and fluent and educated, Prince George's County. Just gonna give me all the hard questions on my last day. My last day. <laughs> um, you know, I think like a lot of counties. Prince George's County also has its 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 uh, challenges, and I think that um, you know the 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 county executive is is doing what I think he can to um, to make sure that the the school system has its proper funding. I think it, it's had a long history of. Um, of, of trying to make sure that they can serve the needs of, of, of different generations of, of kids that are coming into the schools. And uh, I can only tell you that Prince George's African American Museum has a great relationship and wants to continue to have a relationship with the Prince George's County Schools and, uh, and, and uh, is currently serving 41 uh, uh, locations um, with, with arts programming related to, to Prince George's County African American uh, arts and history. So um, I, th I think that there's, you know, there's challenges and, and I think that there are, there are great smart people dealing with those challenges. The museum is, is hopefully helping and um, that's about all I'm going to say about that. Correct me if I'm wrong. They had to get, um, you still had to get state approval to remove trim. Um, he had to lobby in Annapolis to get that uh, removed. Um, 
So the question I have is, um, with the red skin potentially moving out of the <laughs> sorry about that, I mean, <laughs> so what do you think the financial impact was prior to them coming to Prince George's County versus how it's going to affect the county and how it may also affect D.C. and maybe um, Virginia as well? Uh, I, I, I like the Redskins and, uh, you know, I, I like them being in Prince George's County and, but I, I understand that, uh, they have to make the best decision that they have to make. Uh, I think that it's, it's probably done very well, um, for Prince George's County. And, um, I, I think it's, it's, um, you know, part of a larger strategy to attract, uh, businesses. And, um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I, I think the, the impact has been, has been good. Um, Jake just mentioned that, um, Prince George's in the so-called suburbs, like Virginia and Maryland were the biggest slaveholding states. And then after the Civil War, um, a lot of the black folks stayed there, but also a lot of them moved across the river or down the road into D.C. and Georgetown. And then um, in terms of moving to the suburbs, so here's my question, and I just comment. Have you considered who were the people who left DC, like in terms of moving to the birds, um, who were the people who left DC in 1950, 1954, especially after school desegregation and the so called white flight? Who were the people who moved to uh, Arlington, for instance? Who were the people who moved to Tacoma Park? Um, initially, a lot of white folks moved to Prince George's County. And when I say who were they, you know, like you said, what well, you said. Uh, Tacoma Park has a reputation for being very liberal. Mm -hmm. So aside from the Adventist Church, and not that the Adventists are really all that liberal, right. and I have a lot of Adventists in my so it's not about Adventism. But who were the liberals who moved to Tacoma Park? And then who were the people who moved from D.C. into Arlington? And who were the people who moved to Prince George's County? <laughs> <laughs> I can start from Freedman's Village. When they disbanded Freedman's Village, they created the three black neighborhoods in Arlington. They also created a tent city where the Pentagon is now that was called Queen City. It was mainly trailers, but it was commonly known as like a tent city, Queen City. And so when the they said we're building the Pentagon and you people have to leave, a majority of them went to D.C. What parts, I uh, couldn't tell you, but they migrated into D.C. and the rest stayed close into South Arlington. And that's the best answer I can give you for that. And, and you have lots of uh, people in Virginia who are uh, second, third, fourth generation, fifth generation Virginians who just stayed in uh, Virginia. Um, and we know that uh, with the forts I mentioned earlier, the forts that ringed the city during the Civil War, that once after the 1851 um, Confiscation, con excuse me, Confiscation Act, which said if you could get to a fort, they wouldn't send you back even though the Fugitive Slave Act was in, enacted at that time. So many people just picked up a sack and went to the for closest fort that they could find uh, that ringed the city. And we, we see that those communities like ours is 150 years old. We know that, at least 150 years old around Fort Ward. Uh, and it's just similar to what's happened uh, you see now, you can still see vestiges of those communities, and those people did not move. You know, they stayed there. Freedman Village is right where Henderson Hall is today. It is 17 acres, and it sat, this is what the Park Service told me, it sits right there where Henderson Hall is, and Henderson Hall sits on 17 acres. If you know where the uh, Sheraton is on Columbia Pike, 
It's the Henderson Hall is behind it. Oh, that's a good question. I do know that answer. Seventeen thousand. Was it seventeen? I will go with seventeen thousand with what. Uh, it was a. It was a very big. I mean, it wasn't a village. <laughs> you know, it could have counted as a city. Yeah. And uh, Freedman's Village uh, came about because during the emancipation there was a migration to this area to Washington D.C. So that that caused a outbreak of smallpox. So then the government had to get together with an organization called the AMA, which was a women's group that helped the wounded soldiers and everything. They, they provided medical assistance to the military. So the military went to them and said, how do we combat this smallpox uh, outbreak? They said, we need to contain this and work with it from there. So then they worked together and said that they will we will build this place called Freeman's Village, which was the model for the rest of the South when they ran upon people who were free and there were just a mob of them. So while they well, but they didn't talk. Uh, so the Freeman's Village uh, got their 17 acres because Mariah Syfax was willed the property through George Washington Park Custis. He owned the property of Arlington Cemetery. And Robert E. Lee married his daughter. That's why Robert E. Lee was even on the property. So when the Union soldiers won and they wanted to put a, a black eye or some sort of trophy on his property, they said, we'll build a cemetery. And they built it in the farthest corner of where Freedman's Village was. And they built the graves in that direction and told them, we're coming this way, so now you have to disband. And I, I want to correct myself. I said 1851. I meant 1861. And that's when we have the great contraband movement. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Uh, race played a, slavery played a role in the retrocession of, of Virginia away from D.C. Part of that, that dynamic is also around what we now call statehood or representation. What happened when the folks from Virginia and Maryland ended up in Washington, D.C. to realize that they lost their voting rights. And so the struggle for home rule, the statehood really begins very early on. 3 reasons uh, they gave was the slave trade, the uh, lack of voting rights, and the fact that uh, the federal government did not put any federal buildings in Virginia, and those people were, they were very upset. They felt like stepchildren, and so for those three reasons, they wanted to go back to uh, be part of Virginia. Yolanda Corda and Marjan Shalal. I'm our executive director who asked me not to single her out. Oh, uh, oh Chris, we already introduced her. Um, Joy Ford Austin, our director, is seated down in front. And I'll 
also Louis Speaks, our Director of Development, is there in the back. Applications tomorrow for those who are working on them. Just go back and finish them tonight and send them in. Um, I had a couple of announcements I wanted to make before we break. Um, the first one concerns uh, Lewis, actually. And Lewis, if you could talk very briefly about our grant program, uh, that would be good. <coughs> And Lewis used to be the director of the Alexandria Black History Museum before he came on board in that Thanks, Dave. Uh, very quickly, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> talk about our next grant cycle, which is the BCCHP. If we did a really quick um, run on uh, getting our uh, workshops organized, our next series of grants is in cooperation with um, the um, preservation office here in the city. And it basically allows laymen to uh, have a close contact and a personal way of telling a story about DC's history. It culminates in a showcase in December. Uh, the grant period will start, uh, grant applications will be, go online. In fact, that tomorrow on March 4th, it's a DC Community Heritage Project program. And we will have a series of training programs um, to help you learn how to write grants. Also to create effective oral histories as part of that. We have had several come into our office, which eventually will get mounted onto our digital museum. Our grant uh, workshops will occur on Tuesday, April 5th at 6 to 8.30 p.m. at the Benning Library in Northeast. Monday, April 11th at the Shaw uh, Library right down the street from the um, Humanities Office uh, at 1637 Street. And on Wednesday, the 13th from 6 to 8.30. In case you're not able to make the evening uh, activities, we're also going to have them um, from 11 to 1.30. The um, hour and a half program will actually allow you to have the initial ways of uh, writing a grant, and then the later part of the program, your oral history will train you in the techniques. I was uh, also uh, advised to make sure that we are aware of our raffle. We have a door prize that uh, Jay will bring up Diane to talk about the door prize. Yes, I'd like to invite Dan Griffin, our community development director, to talk about the raffle and also to introduce members of her family or the audience. And then I will introduce members of my family. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Anthony Mantini. I am Diane, and I am the director of development and communications. Lewis is our director of grants. So if you are confused about the two, I handle the money that comes to us. He handles the money that comes from us. So people always get confused about the difference in our two roles. Um, as I do handle the money that comes to us, one of the things that we like to do at Humanitini is offer up a raffle or door prize of donated goods. And we have some goods that have been given to us by DC Proud, who is one of our sponsors. So everyone should have gotten a raffle ticket. Do you have your tickets? Yep. All right, I'm going to have Jay come up. Hold on. Okay, ready? Do we have another ticket? One more? Hold on, one second. Shake it up. Shake it up. It sounds crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
programs that we do, we fund ourselves. So we ask that you support us. We are accepting donations. You can give here at the Humanity, or you can give online. And we hope that you will continue to come out and continue to support us as you are able. Thank you so much. Wait, thank you. Oh, he's reminding me to say my bonuses. Okay, so first we have my lovely mommy. Oh. She's just coming back from Colombia, South America. I haven't seen her for almost three months. Oh. So I'm so happy she's home. And then my beautiful boy, Diego. Okay, my cousin, Garrett Martin, is here. Mm -hmm. He's a family doctor. We're all very proud of that. And my aunt Sharon is sitting right there. From Geo, Maryland, which is a very small town close to Annapolis. All right, thank you all very much for coming. Don't